Blank Park Zoo is more than just a place to come see animals. We're a conservation organization working to use the zoo to educate thousands to help save animals in the wild. And just by coming tonight, you are helping to save animals in the wild because a portion of every dollar that we make goes to wildlife conservation projects all over the globe to help hornbills in Thailand, snow leopards in Mongolia, giraffe in Namibia, and butterflies and bees right here in Iowa. And as you know, pollinator conservation is a cornerstone of Blank Park Zoo's efforts. In 2014, when we created Plant Grow Fly to encourage the community to plant pollinator habitat from backyard gardens and front yard gardens to a vast prairie restorations, um, these pollinator pit stops span the state of Iowa and the Midwest. To date, we have 1,200 registered gardens with the project, and we have many partners in the room tonight. Thank you. And we have 60 local, regional, and national partners all working together to preserve butterflies and bees and pollinators um, and so many other creatures that our speaker tonight will talk about. When we first started Plant Grow Fly, everybody asked me the same question. Have you read the book, Bringing Nature Home? The book written by our speaker tonight served as a roadmap for Plant Grow Fly and inspired thousands to change the way that we think about gardening, about our yards, and about the native animals that are fighting to survive in a changing landscape. He's a professor of entomology and wildlife ecology at the University of Delaware, has authored 92 research publications, and has taught for 37 years. It is my distinct honor to introduce to you Dr. Doug Tallamy. Well, thank you. Um, you know, I've talked all over the, the country, but I have to say, you, you people easily take the hardcore award. <laughs> <laughs> you would not find me coming out in a night like tonight <laughs> for anybody. But, uh, okay, what should we talk about? Restoring nature's relationships. You recognize this bird? Birders all over the world recognize this as the resplendent quetzal. It is an endangered species in the forests of Central America, and it's endangered for one primary reason, has a very specialized diet. If you don't have fruits of the wild avocado tree, you don't have that beautiful bird. And we've cut down most of the wild avocado trees. But we want that bird in our future, so we figured out we can actually plant them again. That's what that is there. Fortunately, they grow pretty quickly. They reach the age at which they produce those fruits in not too many years, and it's starting to look better for the future of that beautiful bird. That same conservation scenario is repeated time and again, though, if you want to save jaguars, you have to have particular species of palm trees. Why palm trees? Because they make palm nuts. And palm nuts are the favorite food of peccaries, which is the favorite food of jaguars. <laughs> so we're talking about specialization in the natural world, but particularly focused on food webs as being uh, the rule. It's not the exception. And it always starts with plants. Uh, this is Phlox divaricata, very common spring ephemeral, at least back east. Do you have it here? Yes. yes. Um, spreads readily from seed, but only if it's pollinated. If you look at the entrance to that corolla, it's extremely narrow. I've watched native bees land on those flowers, try to get their mouth parts in there, and they can't do it. So who's pollinating our phlox? It's day-flying sphinx moths, things like this, this uh, hummingbird sphinx or this snowberry clearwing. They have very long tongues, and they sink them deep into that corolla. And when they pull it out, it is covered with pollen. And then they move to the next flower and pollinate it really efficiently. So you can get your, pox, your flocks pollinated if you have adult snowberry clearings. And you can have adult snowberry clearings if you have larval snowberry clearings. And you can have larval snowberry clearings if you have coral honeysuckle, which is the native honeysuckle. That's the host plant for that, that uh, caterpillar. Even animals we don't think of as having specialized relationships with plants often do. And I'm going to use the Carolina chickadee as an example. <clears throat> you have the black cat chickadee here. It's very similar doing the same thing. And we always think of our chickadees as seed eaters because it's one of the most common birds at our feeders, eating seeds. But when it comes time to make babies, the, the babies can't eat seeds. And that's true for most birds. So they have to switch to something else. Uh, chickadees switch to caterpillars. And if they are in a healthy environment, they will feed their babies exclusively on caterpillars. And it turns out that uh, they're not exceptions. Most birds are doing that. Most birds rear their young on insects, and most of those insects are caterpillars. So let's ask the question, why caterpillars? What is special about caterpillars? A number of things. First of all, they're, they're soft, relatively soft. So think of this caterpillar as, as like a sausage, has a very thin 
exoskeleton cuticle, which is undigestible and a lot of, lot of meat in there. And that means you can stuff them down the throat of your, your baby without fear of injuring it. And if you've watched a, a parent bird rear their young, that's what they do. They're just like a plunger, they stuff it down there. They're also relatively large prey items. One medium-sized caterpillar is equal to the biomass of 200 aphids. So some of our smaller birds do chase aphids around, but you want to chase 200 aphids or get one caterpillar. They're nutritious. They're very high in protein, very high in fats. Uh, they have a low percentage of, of chitin. So again, let's compare this to a beetle. This is a sausage, but a beetle's like a little tank. Uh, and most of that chitin is undigestible, so uh, this is a, a much better meal. And it turns out they are the best source of carotenoids. Now I mentioned carotenoids because those are compounds that are only made by plants. We vertebrates don't make them, yet they are essential components of our diet. We don't make them, but we need them. And that's why my wife Cindy tells me I have to eat my carrots to get my beta carotene. There were carrots out there. You could have gotten your beta carotene. I have to eat my tomato to get my lycopene, my whatever that is, to get my lutein. <clears throat> and she makes sure I get all of that stuff because if I do, they stimulate my immune system. I'm generally healthier if I have lots of carotenoids. Um, they're antioxidants. They run around our body and protect our DNA from oxidative damage. They, they, they improve color vision. When your mother said, eat your carrots, you will, you will see better, she was right. She didn't know she was right, but it turns out she was right. They improve sperm vitality. Who doesn't need that? <laughs> Im improve sexual attractiveness. Now we're talking about, about uh, particularly male birds like this prothonotary warbler takes the, the carotenoids and builds pigments out of them and then puts them in his feathers. So he's bright yellow because he's had access to lots of lutein. And the brighter yellow he is, the more ladies he attracts. So that's a good thing. Okay, back to chickadees. They're vertebrates, so they can't make their own, their own carotenoids. They've got to get them from plants, but they're not eating plants, so they've got to get them from something that did eat a plant. And yes, that something is insects, but uh, here's a brand new data set we just generated looking at carotenoid content of different types of insects. So the first bar here are, are sawfly larvae, and the second are, are regular lepidopter caterpillars. Birds recognize both of them as caterpillars, so we can average that out around here. Then we've got crickets and, and crane flies and all the way down to, to worms. Uh, but look at spiders. They're a major component of bird, bird uh, diet, but uh, they're, what, six times lower in carotenoids than, than our caterpillars. So the point is here, we've got a lot of carotenoids and, and caterpillars. Here's a, a, uh, a study showing how birds select their their uh, prey items. This is bluebirds as a function of the total carotenoid content. And look, they take more caterpillars than anything else, and caterpillars have more carotenoids than anything else. So it does seem that they are picking prey items based on carotenoid content, which means for most birds, caterpillars may not be optional. They may be essential components of, of diets. And that means you're not going to have any chickadees if you don't have enough caterpillars. So that's the next question. How many, how many caterpillars does it take to make a clutch of chickadees? And the answer is it takes a lot. And it was these birds that taught me that. I, I put a little chickadee box up in my yard because I wanted, this was years ago, I wanted to see what they were bringing back to the nest. Uh, and that's when I learned they were bringing back caterpillars, but I also learned they're bringing them back very quickly. About one caterpillar every three minutes. You got both the parents out working all the time. So about one caterpillar every three minutes comes to the nest. I watched them for 27 minutes at one point and they brought back 30 caterpillars. How did they do that? By bringing back more than one at a time. Sometimes a whole bunch. And they'll do this all day long, 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. So they're working really hard. The next question is how many species of caterpillars do the chickadees bring back to this? And this is an important, an important question. First of all, chickadees are foraging about 50 meters from the nest. They're not flying five miles down the road to the nearest woodlot. That would take a lot more energy than they get from, from whatever they're finding down there. Um, so whatever they, they, they uh, need to feed their babies has to be within 50 meters of the nest. I watched them for three hours, and during that three hours, they brought back 17 species of caterpillars. And that's important. Because if I had one or two species of caterpillars in my yard, and it happened to be a bad year for those caterpillars, because the populations fluctuate, there wouldn't be nearly enough caterpillars to feed those baby chickadees. But if I have 17 species or 34 species or 134 species, and I'm actually counting them now, I'm up to 879 species of caterpillars in my yard. There will always be some combination of those species. So no matter what the weather, in combination, there will be enough caterpillars to feed those, 
those chickadees. Uh, and that's really important. This is an example of diversity creating stability in the food web or diversity creating stability in the ecosystem. You've heard diversity is good. This is a primary reason. Okay, a guy by the name of Brewer was working on, on Carolina chickadees years ago, and one of the things he needed to know was how many caterpillars they bring back to the nest every day. So he looked at a whole bunch of, of nests, and he found it was between 390 and 570 caterpillars per day, depending on the number of chicks in the nest. And they're in the nest for 16 days before they fledge. So up to the point where they fledge, that's 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars. Now, after they fledge, the parents continue to feed them caterpillars for another 20 days. But they're flying all around, so nobody, nobody knows how many that is. But you're talking about many, many thousands of caterpillars to make one clutch of chickadees. And it's a tiny bird. It's a third of an ounce. That's four pennies. Four pennies worth of bird. What if I wanted to make a red-bellied woodpecker? It's eight times heavier than a chickadee. How many caterpillars does that make? And I don't want just chickadees and red belly woodpeckers. I want scarlet tanagers and tip mice and blue jays and bluebirds and tree swallows and common yellow throats and indigo bunnings and towhees and yellow warblers and wood thrushes and wrens and cardinals and hummingbirds. These are all birds that used to be common in our neighborhoods. And I don't want just one pair. I want breeding populations of these birds. How many caterpillars does that take? It's a lot. It's a lot. And you might say, well, you don't need any, any insects for your hummingbird because it eats sugar water. And there it is, eating sugar water. But 80 to 90% of a hummingbird's diet is insects and spiders, and then they go get the sugar water. And that's something we forgot. And that is true for 96% of all the terrestrial birds in North America. They are rearing their young on insects, either directly or indirectly. When I say indirectly, it means if they ate a spider, the spider needed an insect to become a spider. So it's really all about insect protein. And this is news to, to a lot of people. It's news to people who write Landscape for Birds books because they will tell you how to put plants in your yard that make seeds and berries. A lot of birds do eat seeds and berries, particularly berries after they have reared their young. But they're not going to reproduce at all unless they have those insects. So we need to put the plants in our yard that make the insects so the birds will be there to eat the seeds and berries later on. So a little bit of a generalization, but, but not much. No insects, no baby birds. All right, how do we do that? What types of landscapes are capable of producing the, the diversity and abundance of insects that we're talking about here? Well, to answer that question, we have to go back to specialized relationships. We have to talk about the most common type of specialized relationship that occurs all over the planet, and that's the relationship between the insects that eat plants and the plants themselves. So things like this polyphemus moth caterpillar and the oak leaf that it's eating. Plants don't want to be eaten. They want to capture the energy from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they've loaded their tissues with nasty tasting chemicals, secondary metabolic compounds that make those tissues either bitter or downright toxic. And it's a really effective defense that keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world. But we do know that insects eat plants, so how do they do that? How do they get around those chemical defenses? Well, they specialize. 90% of the insects that, that eat plants are what we call host plant specialists. They pick one or two plant lineages that share a common cocktail of chemical defenses, and they get good at getting around, at circumventing that, that uh, defense system. They, they develop the enzymes and the behavioral adaptations and the life history adaptations that allow them to eat those plants without dying. But it takes a long period of exposure to those plant lineages for all those adaptations to fall into place. And I'm going to use the, the monarch butterfly as, as an example because you already know half the story of the monarch. You already know that it is a specialist on milkweeds. You also know that milkweeds are poisonous plants. They produce cardiac glycosides. And that's why we don't go running out and eat, eating milkweeds because if we did, it would stop our hearts. It does not stop the heart of the monarch, and they do have a heart, by the way, because they've got those enzymes that, that store and excrete and detoxify cardiac glycosides. But what about the sticky latex sap that is in milkweeds? It gives milkweeds its common name. When you break open the, the uh, vein of a milkweed leaf, all this white goo comes out. If you get it on your finger, you usually wipe it off right away, but if you don't wipe it off and let it sit there, in maybe one or two minutes, it starts to gel. On exposure to air, it turns into a chewing gum-like substance, and that's the defensive property of that stuff. If it gets on the mandibles of an insect, on their mouth parts, it glues them shut, and then, then the caterpillar will starve to death. So that's the next question. How does the monarch eat milkweeds, and we know they do, without gluing their mouth parts shut? 
And this is something you can watch in your yard. Plant your milkweeds, the monarchs will come. The caterpillar walks onto a new leaf. It usually goes to the end of it and starts to eat. And if any, excuse me, if any latex sap comes out, stops eating immediately, turns around, goes back up the leaf, and about two thirds of the way up, he starts to chew through the midrib. And he chews and he chews until he's completely severed this midrib. And what he's doing is severing the canals that shunt the latex sap down to this end of the leaf. And as soon as he's finished that, he turns around, goes back down to the bottom. And now he can eat the leaf without any latex sap coming out at all. It's a very simple but very effective behavioral adaptation that beats milkweeds in their second line of defense. Now that flags the leaves. So if you're a, a monarch hunter, you can drive down the road and look at a milkweed patch and know right away whether there are milkweed, uh, monarch larvae there because of these flagged leaves. Okay, those are the upsides of specialization. The monarch can, can eat a plant which is unavailable to most other insects because they haven't figured out how to get around those cardiac glycosides and the sticky latex sap. The downside of specialization is that now that's all monarchs can eat. So by, by focusing all their evolutionary attention on one genus of plant, um, they have not spent any time developing the adaptations that help them get around the tannins that are in oaks, or the cucurbitacins in cucurbits, or the cyanide in cherry, or the nicotine in tobacco. Every plant has a defense. So out of 2,137 plant genera in North America, the monarchs can eat one. And it works as long as there's milkweeds around. But if we take the milkweeds away, then we get those, those terrible declines that we have seen in our monarch populations. And of course, that's what we've done. We've never shared our residential landscapes very well with milkweeds. We used to rely on the edges of, of ag fields, um, but we have a new, a new agricultural ethic. A lot of those edges are now lawn or they're bare soil because we have Roundup Ready corn and soybeans and we spray right up to the road. And, and the weeds that supported the monarch or the, the goldenrods and asters that support the monarch's migration as they move south. All of those flowering plants that we call weeds that support the 4,000 species of native bees that are out there, in so many places now they are gone. Uh, and that's it, that's what specialization is all about. You take the plant away and then you're taking the animal away. But there's good news here. We can use the knowledge of specialization to rebuild food webs wherever we wanna do that. All we have to do is know what those food webs are, are built from, what they're comprised of. Let's use the, the uh, white-eyed vireo as an example here. I'm gonna use that as an example because that is the nest that Cindy found in our yard a few years ago. Now the, the vireos knew that to reconstruct their food web, I had to take pictures of the caterpillars that they bring back to the nest. So they built the nest very low. So I could set my camera up again. If I know the caterpillar, we know a lot about what caterpillars eat. We know a lot about their host plants. So if I can identify the caterpillar, then I'll know what plant is necessary to support these white-eyed vireo babies. So let's do that for a little bit. That is the blinded sphinx moth. It's a specialist on black cherry. We have a lot of black cherry uh, in our yard, making blinded sphinx moths so the babies get to eat. This is the uh, chestnut chisora, and despite its common name of chestnut, it's a specialist on native viburnums. At our house, that's viburnum dentatum, arrowwood. We know that because our yard was mowed for hay, uh, before we moved in, so we know the plants that are there, we put them there, and that's the viburnum we chose. It's now making uh, chestnut chisura, so the babies get to eat again. This little guy here with the white stripe is the drab prominent, it's a specialist on sycamore. And we did not plant sycamore in our yard, but um, about two years after we moved in, there was a big wind, blew in some sycamore seeds from, from someplace, one landed in my cold frame and it germinated. Uh, and I'm not very fast at weeding things out. It's now about 50 feet tall. <laughs> but it is making, it's making drab prominence. Uh, it's also making more sycamores, too, at this point. And, and the babies get to eat again. So on and on we go. This is uh, the eight-spotted forester moth, a specialist on native grapes. We have lots of native grapes. The lunate zaley, another specialist on black cherry. This is the spicebush swallowtail. Uh, it's a specialist on spice bush uh, and, and uh, sassafras, a very close relative. That's the phony eye on its prothorax. It's supposed to scare the bird into thinking it's a tree snake. It didn't work this time. That's the tufted bird dropping moth, another specialist on black cherry. So black cherries emerging is a really important component of this bird's food web. These guys are hungry. 
They need a lot more than that. So let's put some, some black walnut in the landscape. If we do that, we get the walnut sphinx, the gray edge boma loca, the black blotch caesura, the bride, all specialists on black walnut where I come from. Native maples will give us plagodes inchworms, the green stripe maple worm, the maple bantam dagger moth, and of course many others. This is American elm, very powerful tree, gives us the four horned sphinx, the double tooth prominent, the interrupted dagger moth. Remember, 90% of the insects we need to reconstruct these food webs will not be there if we don't put the plants that make those, those insects in our yard. So if I want the mustard sallow, I need witch hazel. If I want the hackberry emperor, I need hackberry. If I want the Cuculio asteroides, I need native asters. The Arcidura flower moth, the, the goldenrod uh, flower moth, the brown hooded owlet all need goldenrod. The hog sphinx, Pandora sphinx, abbot sphinx all need Virginia creeper. The red bud leaf roller needs red bud. The gray furcula needs native willows. Turbulent phosphilla needs green briar. And the orange tufted oneida, the spiny oak caterpillar, the two spotted oak punky, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the red humped oak worm, the orange humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm, the delightful dagger moth, the pleasant dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the streaked dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the crown bucolatrix, the white blotch heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the red line panopoda, and the laugher all will not be there if you don't have oaks. Because oaks, yes. We should clap for oaks, because they are the most important plant you can put in, in your yard. By the way, you know where I took all those pictures? Most people say, in your backyard. And then I say, no, in my front yard. <laughs> I don't like the term backyard habitat because it implies you can't use your front yard because everything's too ugly to put in your front yard. It's not too ugly. You can put your oaks in your front yard. Uh, it also cuts our, our, our uh, conservation actions in half if we eliminate the front yard. Why do we need all these insects? It's not just for the birds. They do need them, but so do most other things. Uh, most of our spiders eat, eat insects. Well, all the spiders eat insects, so they eat other spiders that, that ate insects. And a lot of people don't like spiders, but look who does. It's the second most important component of, of bird food webs. And they're really important predators themselves. Then we have insect predators that are eating the insect herbivores. If we lost the herbivores, we would lose these predators, and they themselves are part of, of food webs. If we lost our insects, we would lose our frogs, we'd lose our toads, we would lose all the amphibians, because they all eat insects. So do our lizards, so do our bats, so do our rodents, because of really good food. Pound for pound, there, uh, some studies have shown there's twice as much protein in insect meat as there is in beef. Uh, and insects have organs in their abdomen called fat bodies. They're loaded with lipids, high energy compounds that allow these little guys to grow quickly and reproduce quickly. And if you're a mouse, that's what you want to do, because there's a lot of things that want to eat you. But it's the same reason that larger organisms are eating, eating insects. A skunk is digging up your yard to get the, the grubs in your yard because they're really good food. Chipmunks eat a lot of insects. Raccoons eat a lot of insects. Even things we don't think of as insectivores eat a lot of insects, like red foxes. 25% of a red fox's diet is insects. 23% of a black bear's diet is, is insects. So it doesn't matter how big you are, you need insects. Even if you don't eat insects, you need insects. This is a sharp shin hawk, it's a bird predator. And no, you can't have sharp shin hawks in your neighborhood even if you get rid of all your insects or if you get rid of all your insects because you'll get rid of the birds too and that's what he eats. So he needs them indirectly, same as your garter snake. It's not eating insects directly but it's eating the frogs and toads that ate the insects. So a world without insects is a world without biological diversity and E.O. Wilson told us decades ago that a world without biological diversity is a world without humans. And, and we're long past due paying attention to that because we are losing the biodiversity that keeps us alive on this, on this planet. And waiting till it's gone is not the time to start, start acting. We need to start acting now. What is happening to all those species that do eat, eat insects? In most cases, we are not, not measuring it, but we do measure what's happening to birds. We have something called the State of the Birds Report. It comes out every year. Uh, and each year they measure something else. Well, in 2016, they measured uh, how bird populations were doing in North America, and they found that 432 species of North American birds are now at risk of extinction. And we have 600 and something breeding species in, in North America. Uh, so two thirds of our birds at risk of extinction. And that doesn't mean that's because there's only five left of each. It means because their populations are 
precipitously declining, and that's the signal for extinction. Not only do we have to, people say we gotta slow the decline. No, we have to stop the decline and have them increase. We now have 1.5 billion fewer breeding birds today than we had just 40 years ago. And I'll remind you that a billion is a thousand million. It's a lot of birds that are not here. And this is, this is the problem with, with shifting baseline. If you don't remember the birds 40 years ago, when there were 1.5 billion more birds here now, then you don't miss the ones that are gone. None of us missed the passenger pigeon because it was gone before any of us were born. It was the most, most numerous bird on the planet, about four billion of them, totally gone. So if we don't miss them, we don't do anything about it. 46 species have lost half their population. None of the stats are very good, uh, uh, are very encouraging about our bird population. So we need to figure out what's wrong and we need to fix it. We do have parks and we have preserves and part of their, their mandate is to keep these species around. It's not working. So let's figure out what's going on. It's not working. There are a couple reasons that it's not working, but the biggest one is that those parks and preserves are too small. They're too small. When you take a large area like this and you shrink it down to a little habitat fragment, and when I get up in a plane tomorrow morning, if I'm still awake, <laughs> I look out the window, that's what I see. I see little tiny habitat fragments, and, and that's what's left of, of nature. Well, these, these areas are too small to sustain populations, and this is, this is why. When you have a large population, all populations fluctuate. In good times, they go up. and bad times, they go down. If you are a large population, even in your down cycle, there's enough individuals so you can increase quickly when times get better. But if you're a tiny population in these normal fluctuations, you often hit zero, you blink out of your little habitat patch, and then you're gone. And unless you recolonize it, and our, our habitats are so fragmented, that's very difficult these days. And for a lot of organisms like box turtles or something, you don't cross, cross the road, you get squashed. Then you're permanently gone, and that's called local extinction. And local extinction is what we need to pay attention to, not, not global extinction. I don't care if these species are doing fine in the Great Smoky Mountains. We need them to do fine everywhere because they're part of, of running our local ecosystems. Think about the number of species in your yard now and the number of species that used to be there. If you have fewer, you have a degraded ecosystem. So that's what we have to think about. Studies all over the planet are telling us the same thing. Our natural areas are not large enough to sustain the nature we need them to sustain. And unfortunately, that includes our largest national parks. Another problem, uh, yeah, I've learned that, that people have uh, a limited ability to absorb bad news. I call it your bad news cup, and when it's filled up, that's it, you, you, you cut off. Um, and you might have come here with your bad news cup fill up, I don't know. But we need to get one more bit of bad news into your bad news cup, and, and it's about invasive species. Let's just talk about invasive plants. We now have 3,300 species of plants from someplace else. They are non-native, aggressively displacing native plant communities. That's the definition of an invasive species. 3,300 of them. Uh, and that's what it looks like when they get into uh, one of our parks. This is White Clay Creek State Park. Uh, I drive by it on the way to work. And this is what it looks like in March when all the plants from Asia have leafed out before plants from North America. It's a very convenient time to look at your natural areas and assess their, their alien plant load. You can see it's a big alien plant load. More than a third of the vegetation in this, this park is now from Asia. And our insects have not been able to adapt to them. They haven't been here nearly long enough and you know, 50 years is not long enough. It's, we're talking about tens of thousands of years. And in the meantime, they've, they've pushed out the native vegetation that do support our, our uh, insect populations. We can measure what happens when we replace native plant communities with plants from someplace else. And that's what we've been doing in, in, in my lab for the last, I guess it's 12 years now. We have a number of, of publications. You can go to the literature and you can read them. But I know you're not gonna do that. So let me tell you something that you can do or get your kids to do, the local school kids, your grandkids. This is my 12 by 12 experiment. This is 12 feet by 12 feet staked out. Now you get to determine how much life can exist in that space by determining how many plants are there and which plants are there. You can keep it as lawn. You can get on your hands and knees on, on Wednesday and count all the biodiversity that's in there. It won't take you long. And then of course on Saturday you mow it and kill it all. Or we could put a tree in there. Let's put a white oak in there. Here's a white oak I planted from an acorn, and it fills that 12 by 12 space really nicely. 
It's 14 years old in that picture, which, which proves two things, if I can digress a little bit. First of all, um, oaks grow. I hear landscapers tell people, oh, don't plant an oak, you won't live long enough to enjoy it. I'm enjoying it. I'm not dead yet. You don't, it doesn't have to be 300 years old before you can enjoy your oak. The other thing is, it was, three, it was free, acorn. You don't have to spend $15,000 getting a, a four inch caliber oak, which is a bad idea because that's been root pruned so much it's got a 50% chance of dying. And if it doesn't die, it'll just sit there for more than a decade trying to rebuild those roots where your acorn will pass it. Okay, let us, let's do uh, our 12 by 12 experiment by walking around the perimeter of that tree and counting the caterpillars just on the lower, lower limbs here. We're not gonna climb ladders or anything. Uh, we're going to walk around, count the caterpillars, and we're going to do it on July 25th of 2014. And we are going to find 410 caterpillars from 19 different species on that very tree. And then I'm going to stand back and take that picture so I can ask you, how many of those caterpillars do you see? How much caterpillar damage do you see? That's what we worry about. But if I knocked on your door and said, you've got 410 caterpillars on your oak tree, ah, get the spray can, call the man, save the tree. You don't have to save the tree. That's a happy tree. It's doing what it's always done. That's what oaks do. They support a lot of life. And because they support a lot of life, I've got other life in my yard. I met a woman named uh, Tammany Baumgarten in New Orleans a couple of years ago. And she, she suggests that we practice the 10-step program. Take 10 steps back from your tree and all of your insect problems disappear. <laughs> I think that's good, good advice. All right, same afternoon, let's go to a black cherry. Uh, 12 by 12, count the caterpillars in the lower branches. We're gonna find 239 caterpillars from 14 different species. We're doing an experiment. We're comparing caterpillars on native plants with caterpillars on non-native plants. Where are we gonna find the non-native plants? At my neighbor's house. <laughs> and this is a good comparison because he's got the same size property and he moved in the same month that, that we did, but he had different plant choices. He really liked calorie pear. You might know it as Bradford pear. So he planted 32 of them. So the first thing we have to do is figure out which calorie pear we're gonna measure. <coughs> Actually, the first thing we have to do is make sure he's not home. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna measure this one, 12 by 12, count the caterpillars. I bet you think I'm gonna tell you there were no caterpillars on there. Not so, there was one. <laughs> One geometric inchworm, one species. Then I went to his burning bush. Of course, calorie pear is from Asia. It's a highly invasive species. Burning bush from Asia, highly invasive species. He's got a whole row of it. Uh, carved out a 12 by 12 section. Counted the caterpillars. Four caterpillars from one species. Four little leaf skeletonizers that are too small to be part of a local food web. Okay, we have just done one replicate of our experiment. And we got a very striking pattern. But is that pattern real? It could, we could have gotten that by chance, that happens. So you have to do it over and over again. You've got to replicate in your, your experiment. So let's do it again the next day, July 26. We're gonna get the same pattern. We're gonna get different numbers, but the same pattern. 233 on white oak, 53 on, on black cherry, two in the burning bush, one on the calorie pear. Uh, and it doesn't matter how many times you do that, that's the pattern you're going to get. Because these, these plants from Asia are unable to support the caterpillar life here in, in North America. Rick Dark and I uh, uh, were driving home from a talk a couple of years ago and we drove past the Sunset Beach Inn and Grill and there are all the calorie pears in full bloom and that's why people plant them. One of the reasons. It's the cheapest tree you can get, that's another reason. Uh, but it's the only tree the, the Sunset Beach Inn and Grill liked. Um, and it's got, a, it's got a nice spring bloom, pretty good fall color. You get the ice storm, down it comes, doesn't live very long, but um, there we go. So we kept driving right past the Sunset Beach Inn and Grill and this was the next property. Turns out it's owned by, owned by a, a land conservancy. I don't know how many acres it is, but look, it is thoroughly invaded with the offspring from the Sunset Beach Inn and Grill. So this is the, the, the horticultural ethical dilemma of our time. A lot of people would argue property rights, a Sunset Beach Inn and Grill has the right to put anything they want on their property, but do they have the right to biologically pollute all the land around them? to ecologically castrate it. This is a, a, a tree making one caterpillar. My chickadees can't breed in that. Nothing else can, so, um, so that's a big dead space now. 
And I can drive from New York City to Richmond, Virginia in the spring when these things are in bloom and it is white all the way down. None of them were planted. That's what an invasive species does. It's a very powerful effect. Um, actually, so I got an email not too long ago. Uh, one guy said, you know, uh, I just don't believe that one in species of invasive plant can hurt an ecosystem. Well, these are, these are tumors. Can one tumor hurt your brain? By definition, it will spread, and that's what they do. So yes, even one species. But remember, we got 3,300 species spreading like that. Believe me, they really do have a powerful effect. So which plants should we have in our landscapes? Um, we now have a tool that will direct you to, to the best plants for your county. Um, this is the National Wild, Wildlife Federation website, Native Plant Finder. You go to that website and you put in your zip code and the top ranked woody plants and top ranked herbaceous plants will pop up for your county. And this works for anywhere in the entire country. Similar uh, website put out by Audubon called Plants for Birds. So now we don't have the excuse. We used to have the excuse, we don't know what to plant. We do know what to plant now. We do know what to plant. And when we made this, these uh, lists for every county in the country, we saw a very striking pattern. Uh, it turns out that there's very few plants in any one location making most of the food, supporting most of the caterpillars that are driving these food webs. So we started calling those keystone plants. Uh, and it turns out that just 5% of the local plant species in your area are making between 73 and 75% of the food. Which means I could build a landscape using 95% of the available plants, but if I didn't include these keystone plants, uh, it would be a failed food web. It will only have 25% of the food that, that uh, it actually needs. So this is a nuance. I mean, it used to be native is much better than non-native. Still, still true, but I could build a landscape 100% native that would be a failed food web. And that's not what we're trying to do here. So you've got to include these powerhouse species. Which ones are there? Go to that website. They're the top one, the ones at the top of the list. Remember oaks? Oaks are number one in 83% of the counties in, in North America. There you go. In, uh, in Iowa, uh, you got a lot of counties in Iowa, but on average about 275 species of caterpillars supported by, by oaks. Now let's compare that to ginkgo, ginkgo biloba, which is used often in, in cities, a very, very uh, popular uh, ornamental plant from Asia. Zero, zero species on, on uh, ginkgo. Ginkgo is not invasive, it's not moving around, but it's just sitting there, so it's not supporting any of the wildlife you, you want it to support. Uh, number two on your list, and most lists are native prunus, so things like the black cherry we talked about, 250 species of caterpillars in Iowa. Let's compare that to Zelkova. Do you use Zelkova here? Very common ornamental uh, uh, back, back east. They're using it all over the place. It, it's Looks a little bit like the elms we lost, the Dutch elm disease, so I think that's why they're, they're planting it. Another one from Asia, zero, zero caterpillars. Pieris japonica. Um, this illustrates a very, very important point here. We have a native Pieris, but it's not a, a, a very powerful genus. Only supports two species. I don't think Pieris japonica supports anything. We could have put in a native viburnum that in Iowa supports 76 species. Um, so these are, the, these are the results of the plant choices we make for our yards. It does matter which plant you put in your yard. Think of the plants as if they are, are bird feeders, because really, that's, that's what they are. There you go, they're bird feeders. <laughs> now you get to decide how well you're going to feed the birds by which plants you, you choose. Um, you could feed the birds really well or not much at all. This is what the landscapes around me look like, giant lawns with very few plants. You could put seed in your bird feeders. In other words, pick plants that make lots of caterpillars, or you can keep them empty. There's the ginkgo back there. It's a big tree, but it's not making any food. And we're not fooling the birds when we don't plant with these, these at least include these keystone uh, plants in our, our landscapes. I'm gonna share a little bit of, of data from my recent uh, PhD student, Desiree Narango, who worked with Carolina chickadees in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. She was following breeding pairs of chickadees and looking at their breeding success depend, as a function of the landscape in which they were, they were nesting. Uh, and she could control that a little bit because she put out chickadee boxes. Chickadees are tree hole nesters and tree holes are always in short supply, so if you put a box someplace, they'll try to use it. Uh, the stars where the box is for this pair, the red line represents 
95% of their foraging territory. So they did 95% of the foraging to feed the babies in that nest within that red line. And they did that foraging on these blue, blue areas. Those are the trees that they, they got most of the food from. And they are all the native trees in this landscape. Basswood sweet gum, American elm, black cherry, and two species of, of oaks. But these are the trees the birds did not go to. And they're all the trees from Asia. Japanese maple, silk tree, there's our friend the ginkgo, black poplar, crepe myrtles, saucer magnolia. And it's very easy to picture a landscape uh, where those are the dominant trees. And you might say, well, how does a chickadee know that a ginkgo doesn't have any food? It doesn't know. It goes there once. And it goes there as often as you would go to, to ShopRite or Shop and Bag if the shells were all bare. You say, there's nothing here, I'm not going back. They can't waste energy. So they learn which trees produce the, the most. Um, Desiree looked at enough properties that she could, she could compare properties that were dominated by native plants with pro properties that were dominated by introduced plants. The ones that were dominated by introduced plants had 75% fewer caterpillars. So 75% less food uh, for the chickadees right away. They were 60% less likely to have breeding chickadees at all, even though there's a box up there. So the parents would come, they'd look around, and they had the ability to assess the quality of the landscape based on the quality of the plants in that landscape. Uh, and most of them decided, we're not going to even try here. If they did try, they made 1.5 fewer eggs that were 29% less likely to survive at all, the nests were. It produced 1.2 fewer fledglings, and it took them 1.5 days longer to do that. And you might say, well, those are not big differences. But when you put all those numbers into a population growth model, as a function of the percentage of non-native plants in the landscape, this is what you get. The dotted line is replacement rate. That is the, the rate at which the population has to make babies to replace the adults that die every year. So if you're breeding at this rate, you have a stable population. You can go on forever. Uh, anything below the replacement rate is a declining population. It's not sustainable. And anything above it is a growing population. We well, can see the only place we've got blue above the, the dotted line here is when you have about 30% uh, or or 30% or fewer non-native plants in your, your landscape. So in other words, when your landscape is about 70% native, then your chickadees can sustain their population. But otherwise, it's a declining population. And this is the first time this has been measured for any bird anywhere. Uh, and a couple of important things here. First of all, it gives us, it gives us a target of 30% non-native. And, and, and that's an opportunity for compromise, because a lot of people say, I've got to have my crepe myrtle, I've got to have at least one Bradford pear. Uh, and that's OK, as long as you have those other plants to, to balance it. But when everything in your yard is a non-native, it's, it's not going to work. Uh, so this is the bird that, that uh, wants to breed with humans. It likes humans. It'll take food out of your hand. You can't put up seed when they're breeding, because they can't feed their babies seed. The only thing you can do is put plants that make the caterpillars that, that they really need. She also looked at the migrating birds that stopped in these, these uh, suburban neighborhoods when she was, was working. She got 51 species of migrants that stopped to rest and, and refuel. Migrants fly all night long, and they run out of energy. Around, around 4 or 5 in the morning, they come down, and they, people say they have to rest. But what they have to do is refuel. They've got to gas up so they can continue their migration. And gassing up means they put on between 35 and 50% of their body weight eating the caterpillars in that yard. And if they come down in the land of ginkgo, there's nothing to eat, and that's the end of their migration. So you might say, I don't have a, a property big enough for a breeding bird, and that may be true. But if you have a property big enough for one tree, then you're helping migrants. Because they do stop. They fly right through our cities. They don't fly around them. And they need those powerful trees in order to get to their, their breeding grounds. So you don't have to save biodiversity for a living, but, but please consider saving it where you live, because where you live is now a really important component of, of conservation. We've turned the world into Gone with the Wind here. This is the aesthetic we like. I don't know how many, how many acres that is, um, but I do know there were thousands of species that used to live in that space, and now they're gone with the wind. We need to rebuild the carrying capacity of, of planet Earth. Uh, the ability of planet Earth to support life. We've degraded it. Uh, well, studies show about 60%. That's making planet Earth 60% smaller than, than uh, it used to be. Can't do that very long. Where are we going to do that? I suggest we're going to do that on, on private property. 
85.6% of the U.S. east of the Mississippi is privately owned, and 83% of the entire U.S. is privately, privately owned. <clears throat> so most of the U.S. is privately owned. We're not going to do conservation in those little teeny habitat fragments. I mean, we are, but that's not going to be good enough. We've got to include private property or it's going to fail. In other words, we're going to do it where you live, where you work, where you play, and to a lesser extent where we, where we farm. And to do that, we have to raise the bar about what we ask our landscapes to do. In the past, we've asked them to be pretty, and we're good at that. But now they have to support life. We have to have viable food webs at home. They have to sequester carbon, and you know why. We've got way too much carbon in the atmosphere. And it's doing nasty things up there. I had a, a student say, we need to invent a machine that pulls carbon out of the atmosphere and fixes it and then pumps it in the ground. I said, uh, we have that machine, it's called a tree. <laughs> and we've cut down more than half the trees on the planet. And all of the carbon that the, was, those trees were built of, out of is now in the atmosphere. It's about a third of the carbon that, that is up there. And we've also lost that, that powerhouse machine that's pumping carbon into the soil. And I talk about trees, but your prairie plants do that uh, almost as well, almost as well. We have to clean and manage uh, water in our watersheds. We have to manage our watersheds at home. Nobody has the right to build a landscape that destroys my watershed or yours. And we don't try to do that, but we haven't thought about that. It's plants that manage our watersheds. We have to enrich our soil with carbon. Our soils can hold seven times the amount of carbon that is in the atmosphere right now. Get it out of the atmosphere, put it in the soil. And we have to support pollinators. Supporting pollinators is now politically correct, or it was two years ago. <laughs> why, do we need to, why do we need to support pollinators? Well, because there he says they, they, they pollinate a third of our, of our crops. Um, but you know what? That's not the real reason. They pollinate 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. If we lost our pollinators, we would lose 80 to 90% of the plants on the planet. That is not an option. It's not even close to an option. So it goes way beyond our crops, way beyond our crops. So we're, really, we're not talking about good land stewardship here. We're talking about essential land stewardship. And next time we have an election, you can look at the top 10 artic, uh, things that people are worried about. That's not going to be on the list. So this is a, a house down the street from me. Those are all cattle repairs right there. And actually, they're all gone right now. They all fell down uh, last winter. So now there are no trees in this, in this yard. No food webs here, no pollinators, very little carbon sequestration. Lawn per acre sequesters about 120 pounds of carbon per year. Prairie sequesters about 3,000 pounds of carbon per year. And forests about 3,500 pounds. So prairie and forest pretty equal, pretty equal. Lawn, not so much. The little teeny short, short leaves. And there, it's actively destroying uh, uh, my watershed. This guy is just down the street, street from me. Um, and we have measured the amount of, of lawn in southeast Pennsylvania, Delaware, and northeast Maryland uh, in neighborhoods that are 25 years old. What is it? 92% lawn. 92% of the landscape is, is lawn. Uh, so we're not talking about just a little bit of an area. Only 10% of the tree biomass that could be there is in these properties. So we've thrown out 90% of the trees that could be uh, sequestering carbon. And they're usually these short-lived ornamental trees like, like calorie pear. We've got to do better than that. And this is my neighbor's yard with his 32 calorie pears. He's got 10 acres. Every plant he has put on that property is a non-native plant. And he doesn't know that. He didn't know it in the year from non-native. He simply goes to the nursery and he finds something that's pretty because we have all long ago brought into the idea that plants are just decorations. So you get something that's pretty. Maybe it can be a screen, an anchor, or a focal point, but it's all been about aesthetics. No thought to the ecological roles these plants need to be playing in our yards. And when we think of plants just as decoration, then landscaping equals ecological destruction. And we're doing that in an awful lot of places. But we could find plants that are pretty, but they also support food webs, they protect our watershed, store carbon, do all the things we need them to do. And when we think of, of function when we're choosing our plants, then landscaping becomes ecological restoration. And that's where we have to go. And we have to go there very, very quickly, actually. So what does a biodiversity-friendly suburb look like? This is the most important thing we need to do. We need to create 
we need to put the plants back in between those isolated habitat fragments, create biological corridors that connect them. And when we connect those isolated fragments, they're not isolated anymore. And when they're not isolated anymore, the populations within them are not tiny anymore. So when they fluctuate, they won't disappear anymore. This is the single most important thing we need to do to stop the steady drain of species from our, our neighborhoods. Where are we going to put those plants? I suggest we put them in the area that's in lawn. We've got an area in lawn, about 45.6 million acres. It's the size of New England in lawn. And we're still adding 500 square miles of lawn each year. And we're doing that because lawn is a status symbol. It used to be only rich folks could have, have lawn. Then we invented the, the lawnmower, and all of us poor slobs could have lawn. But you know, in the 50s, if you didn't have a perfect lawn, you were a communist. And now you listen to the, to the commercials. If you have a dandelion, you're just a bad person, and your neighbor's going to hate you. So we all buy into that. But we can change the status symbol. I went to, went to where to go, Montana, a couple of years ago. Uh, and I looked around. They did not have big lawns. And I asked my host, where are your big lawns? And he said, uh, we only get nine inches of rain a year. He said, uh, but lawn is not our status symbol. And I said, it's not? What is your status symbol? And he said, uh, he thought, he said, it's big belt buckles. <laughs> I think that's the answer. <laughs> we're going to double the size of our belt buckles and cut the size of our lawn in half. And we're going to build those, those corridors out of those powerhouse plants we were talking about. This is the way we used to landscape. We build our house, put in a foundation planting, a few trees here and there. Then we're exhausted. No more landscaping. So everything by default becomes lawn. Let's turn that on its head. Let's build the house and now figure out where we want lawn. And we want lawn where we're going to walk. Lawn is the perfect plant to walk on because we don't kill it if we do that. So figure out where you, where you walk. I look at where my neighbor walks on his, his 10 acres, which is golf course-like lawn. Nowhere. It's never outside. <laughs> but maybe you want to get married in the front yard. You need some grass there, a path to go to the backyard, throw the frisbee, have a barbecue. Where are we going to use the yard? That's where the lawn goes. And then everything else by default becomes heavily planted. And this is the landscape design challenge of our times. How do we get all these plants into our landscapes without it looking wild and messy? Are there any landscape designers here? There you go. The ball's in, in your court. <laughs> Figure out how to do that. We can do that. Any arboretum uh, uh, shows you how to, how to do that. And if you convince your neighbors to do the same thing, now you've got the connectivity with the woodlot over here or the, or the woodlot over there, or the prairie over here, prairie over there. This has to be biome specific. You do what belongs there. We can still have lawn. We can still play with our lawn mowers. It'll be OK. If we replant half of the area that is now in lawn, let's make the math simple. Say we've got 40 million acres. We'll cut that in half. We can build a new national park that'll be 20 million acres in size. We're going to do it at home, so we'll call it Homegrown National Park. And it'll be bigger than the Adirondacks, plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, plus Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge, plus the Great Smoky Mountains. You add up all those parks, still less than 20 million acres. So let's do that. Let's take areas that look like this. This is the entrance to the Toledo Zoo in Ohio. Very nice grass path with, with dandelions. And turn it into that. And when the zoo did that, they didn't consult the board of directors. And the board said they were furious. They said, nobody's going to come to the zoo. It's changing culture is really hard. It's really hard. Let's take these square things here. <laughs> Let's turn it into a landscape like this. This is a landscape on, on Fisher's Island, high-end island off of, of uh, um, Long Island. There's a high-end house there. I should have included more of it. But uh, this landscape is doing everything that I, I just said in a biome appropriate way, except supporting the pollinators. So let's put in a pollinator garden too. And now we're doing everything. Uh, you've seen this before. This is the, you know, the new ag ethic, because uh, it looks neat and everything, but all those weeds are gone. But here, this is Iowa. I don't know how many, what you've done, 1,500 miles or something of your roads are, are transformed into, into essentially uh, functional prairies. That's wonderful. This is a mulch sculpture that uh, proves you can't use native plants formally, except nobody told the folks in, in Indianapolis this is an all-native garden in a very, very formal setting. Formality is, is a function of the design. It's not a function of the plants in the design. Our native plants are used in formal gardens in Europe all the time. And I guess it's OK because they're, they're non-native plants over there. Yeah. <laughs> 
This is a corporate landscape that invites the, the employees to come out at noon to get, get sunburn. <laughs> Could be a lovely setting like this. And there's really cool research that shows 15 minutes in a setting like this and there are measurable medical benefits. Your blood pressure goes down, your stress hormone, your cortisol goes down, uh, your cancer is cured, you don't get divorced anymore. <laughs> and the reason I say that is the research is showing that just a little time in an area like this boosts your immune system. It also increases your attention span. It makes you a nicer person so you don't go home and yell at your spouse at the end of the day. But the only way you can get those benefits is to, is to either work in a setting like that or live in a setting like that. Going to Yellowstone for two weeks in the summer will not last the rest of the year. You've got to be exposed to it every day. So I'm going to put human health up there, another ball up there. Or we could put... We could put uh, mental health, but we could put physical health too. Because if I put a plant outside of a hospital room, the patient gets better faster. If I put a, a plant outside of a, a classroom, test scores go up. And everybody's scratching their heads, what is going on? Apparently it all has to do with stress. When we expose ourselves even to a little bit of nature, our stress level goes down and then we do everything else better. So does your yard have to be 100% native to get all these benefits? Uh, the answer is no. It's really not the presence of introduced plants. These are all introduced plants here and there's not many of them, but it's not the presence of introduced plants that causes the problems here, that destroys our ecosystems. It's the absence of native plants. So if you have enough powerful native plants in your yard, you can have your favorite decorative plant like your crepe myrtle. I'm going to use crepe myrtle as an example. I know you don't use too many in Iowa here, but as you move further south, they get pretty common. By the time you get to South Carolina, I think it's the only plant in the state at this point because it's the perfect decoration. You can get it any color. It's got exfoliating bark, not too tall. What do its leaves contribute to, to food webs? Nothing. So what's, what's something pretty that contributes nothing to your yard biologically? I always think of statues, but how many statues? You know, one or two. One or two, otherwise you overdo it. How do you know when you've succeeded? There's a lot of ways to know when you've succeeded, but this has got to be one of them. When you have holes in your leaves. This is holistic gardening. <laughs> That's a shingle oak in my yard, and it has given up part of its energy to a caterpillar which is now in the belly of a bird. And if it hadn't been willing to do that, I wouldn't have the bird or the caterpillar. So when you see something like this, this is a cause of celebration. The plant is doing its job. If you go out and look at all your leaves and there's no holes in them, you've got a dead landscape. They're not passing on the energy. When you have fireflies return, that could be a sign of success. I, I don't, can't tell you how many times people have said, I used to have fireflies or, or lightning bugs when I was a child, and I don't see them anymore. Uh, well, that's, that's an adult. They're not flies or bugs. They are beetles, and that's an adult. That's what the larva looks like. It is a predator in leaf litter. So picture your, picture your yard. If you have no leaf litter, you have no place for this guy to, to live and no food for him, him to eat. Um, if, you have, if you have Kemlon, you're poisoning him. Uh, and if you have your security lights on all night long, you're messing up their, their adult communication. So if you do have fireflies, it's your yard or someplace in your neighborhood, you're doing several things right. But this is the most powerful form of success. When you have breeding birds in your yard, not, not 10 miles down the road, in your yard, because you won't have them if you don't have the food to support, support them. So we can, we can save nature, but only if we learn to live with it. And I'm gonna leave you with uh, one story of how easy this can actually be. This is the Atala butterfly. The residential neighborhoods of South Florida accidentally saved this species from extinction. It's a beautiful little Lycaenid butterfly, beautiful as an adult, beautiful as a larva, beautiful as a chrysalis. And like the other things I talked about tonight, it's a host plant specialist, but in this case, an extreme specialist. It doesn't eat one genus of plant, it eats one species, the Kunti, which is a native cycad in South Florida. And Kunti had an interesting history. It's got a lot of starch in its roots. And the Seminole Native Americans knew that. When the settlers came to Florida, the Seminoles taught them. They had a lot of starch in Kunti roots. Around 1900, somebody said, let's make a starch industry out of Kunti roots. And when they, they did uh, a survey, and I think it was one of the censuses in around 1908 in Miami, 
80% of the people in Miami put down starch gatherer as their occupation. And they did. They gathered all the starch. They eliminated kunti from the wild, uh, extirpated. Uh, it is still gone from the wild. There were a few plants in gardens, but it was essentially gone. So if you take away the only host plant of the Atala, it, of course, disappears. Well, in 1973, we got the Endangered Species Act. And there was a desperate attempt to find some Atala somewhere in, in Florida so they could get it listed as an endangered species so they could get some federal funding and training to save it. But they couldn't find any. So they got it officially listed as extinct. But about that time, the horticultural trade recognized Kunti as a valuable landscape plant. It's a low-growing evergreen shrub that does well in the sandy soils of South Florida. So they started to promote it. And now plantings in parks and people's yards are, are common. Uh, big plantings all over the place. And look who showed up again. I used to say nobody knows where it came from, but now somebody's claiming there was a, a remnant population on one of the keys and it's out colonizing these, these uh, plantings. Kunti's still gone from the wild, so the only place you find the Atala is in, in uh, gardens. And that's what I like about this. Um, it truly was a mistake. They never got the Atala listed as an endangered species, so they never got one dime of conservation funding, which is, which is good, because we don't have very many dimes of conservation funding. The only thing they did was change the palette of, of plants used in residential landscaping uh, by one. They added kunti, and the butterfly saved itself, which shows this is a really powerful form of conservation. If we can save this species uh, from extinction by accident, think what we could do uh, if we made conservation a, a conscious goal of landscaping. And I think it's, I think it's gonna work. Um, Nature has proven to be a lot more malleable, a lot more resilient, a lot more forgiving than I thought she would be. But I guarantee there's, there is a point beyond which she's not going not gonna to bounce back. Uh, but I do think she will give us one more chance. So thank you very much. Thank you.